All right, the title for my sermon this evening is A Servant's Heart. A Servant's Heart. This truth, this sermon is extremely simple, not complicated at all. The title pretty much says it all. I'm going to be preaching on a servant's heart. A servant's heart is one of humility. A servant's heart is one that, that is not lifted up or proud at all. And, and if we can get this down in your life, I mean, anybody that can get this sermon down, Believer, unbeliever, I mean, this is going to go a long way in your life. Pay attention to the points tonight. This is extremely important. This is one of the most important truths that's going to help you throughout your life in general if you can get this doubt. Life would be so much better if everybody were able to put into practice what I'm going to preach tonight about having a servant's heart. And I call it a servant's heart because it starts on the inside. You need to get your heart right in order to truly be a good and faithful servant. One of our goals at the end of our life is that when we're greeted by the Lord, he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant servant. If you're going to be a good and faithful servant, you must have a servant's heart. This is, I can't express how important this is. I can't, I can't overstate this. What is the opposite of human? Because obviously in order to serve, you must be humble because you need to submit yourself unto a higher authority. You're serving somebody else. You're doing things for other people instead of having them do things for you. That is what a servant is. The humility that you need to be a servant, that's the exact diametrically opposite thing as, as pride, right? It's, it's the 100% exact opposite. Now, we look at how bad pride is. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is the very sin that, that led Satan away, right? That, that's what lifts up Satan. It blinds people. Pride is the sin that causes people to get into all manner of other sin. Pride is the sin that God hates. Pride is the sin that God is going to uh, destroy and bring low and humble. We need to learn how to stay humble. Now, I'm preaching on a servant's heart, and every single person in this room tonight is a servant in one capacity or another. Most, if not all, have multiple capacities of being a servant because there's different realms of authority that God has established in this life and different uh, uh, hierarchical structure that you may fall into in those various realms of authority. Children are subject to their parents. Children are subject to God. Children are subject to probably the most number of people because they're children. <coughs> Wives are subject to their husbands. Wives are subject to God. Men are subject to God. Everybody is subject to God. So everybody is going to be a servant in, in some capacity. There are servants within church. There is church authority. There is church structure. There are people who should be serving. Now look. Uh, another name that people will use for pastors are ministers, and I don't have a problem with that either because the pastor ought to be a minister also. So there are people within the church, lay people, if you want to use that term, I don't care, that should be serving the church, but also people in uh, positions, right, positions of authority also do service, also serve, also should be ministering. Now, you could have a dual role, someone who is leading, but also serving. I mean, Christ was a great leader. Would anyone dispute that? But Christ was also a great servant because he was a servant of all in the sense that he came and died for all. He came and gave of himself and was self-sacrificial and completely gave all that he had for the whole world. Yet still a great leader. And the best leaders are the ones who know how to serve. Those are the best leaders. 
So we're going to go through various situations. I, and this may feel like it's all over the place. And that's how my mind was working when, when I was preparing the sermon. So just bear with me. But it's all relevant. It doesn't really matter. There's no particular order that we're going to look at different things. Because we're going to try to apply to different areas of your life that you may be in. And you know, cause another one I didn't mention is on the job, right? I mean, you, you are a servant when you work for somebody else. You have a supervisor or foreman or some kind of boss over you. You are serving. You are serving in that capacity. So we started off in Colossians chapter 3. We need to have the right attitude as a servant look at verse number 17 the bible says and whatsoever ye do in word or deed do all in the name of the lord jesus giving thanks to god and the father by him wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the lord now colossians 3 lines up very closely to ephesians chapter 5 when you when you compare them side by side they're kind of parallel passages and we get a little bit more detail on the husbands and wives in the application there uh, than we are getting here. This is more of a summary, but you can look back to that. I'm not going to do it tonight, but we're starting off looking at one passage here that talks about wives, who you submit yourself to, your husband. You're a servant to your husband. The Bible says when he created uh, man and woman and, and ordained the, the marriage between a man and woman, that the woman Eve was created as a help suitable or meet for Adam that she was the helper for him and was to serve her husband husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them children obey your parents in all things for this is well pleasing unto the Lord now another area again of uh, uh, of servitude of being a servant is children obeying their parents verse 21 fathers provoke not your children to anger lest they be discouraged verse 22 servants Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, this in the context here, obviously we're breaking off wives, husbands, children, servants. The context here of the servant is going to be the servant in the flesh, the servant on the job, whatever. But this verse, this statement applies no matter what context you're a servant. Whether it is at home in the family, whether it is at church, whether it is wherever it may be, this verse rings true 100%. This is where I get the title of the sermon, you know, the, a servant's heart, because it says, Obey in all things your masters according to flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. So you don't just serve when people are looking at you. You don't just serve on the outside because, well, I know I'm just supposed to do this. When people are looking at me, okay, I'm just going to make sure I get this done. And then the rest of the time, I don't really care. You can serve and fill a capacity without really have the servant's heart. But you know what? You're never going to excel. You're never going to be lifted up. You're never going to be raised without having that uh, at least by God, you're not going to. In the sight of man, maybe you will. Man's got a lot of things backwards. But not in the sight of God. Okay, if God, God, we need to learn how to both be abased and how to abound. We definitely need to learn how to be satisfied and how to be content wherever we are in our life. And part of being, you know, that humility of having a servant's heart, you have to be okay with whatever it is that you, wherever it is that you're at and whatever it is that you're doing. Whatever position you have in this life, you need to be content with that. We'll start off with just having with the servants at work. When you work with singleness of heart, when you work when people aren't watching you, it does get noticed. It does. When you're working from the heart and you're saying, no, I'm just going to do the best job I can. Whatever my job is, my boss told me to do this, I'm going to do it. Now, anyone who has experience in the real world working jobs on, in that capacity understands this to be true. Now, yes, have you, I've worked for people, you probably work for people too, where you feel like you're underappreciated, they they're not always looking at what you do, but you don't 
Make your decisions on how you are going to serve based on how your boss treats you. The world may do that, but here's where that philosophy gets you. Here's where that mindset gets you. It gets you to be the person who goes, well, if you're only going to pay me $10 an hour, I'm only going to give you $10 an hour or whatever the price may be. And then they start doing bad work. Well, tell me, I, I've yet to see the employee that has that attitude that's getting raises and bonuses and being promoted. It never happens. Those are the same ones that are going to end up collecting unemployment checks because they're not going to last at their job and they're not going to be able to find another job until they change their attitude. But that's not the mindset of a Christian and that's not how the Bible teaches us we ought to be. We ought to be humble. We ought to be willing to work and do the best job that we can and work as if we are serving the Lord Jesus Christ from the heart. That's why it says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Have your heart in it as to the Lord and not unto men. And I would submit this to you that, yes, that goes for on, when you work on the job. I don't care what your work is. I don't care if you're cleaning toilets with a toilet brush. You make that toilet shine and sparkle so that someone's willing to eat off of it, right? I mean, you do a good job with whatever you're doing. Because you got to think about it this way. If you're working as if you're wor serving the Lord, well, think about the Lord showing up and being like, okay, let's see what you did. How would you like to, what, what, what type of work do you want to show to the Lord? Here's what I did, God. I mean, to God, to your Savior, to Almighty God. W what are you going to show to him? Are you, gonna, are you the one who just cuts the corner? Eh, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, like whatever. Okay, I see you didn't do that great of a job here. What did you do with the rest of your time? Well, um, uh, look, do a good job with the tasks that you're given. It will benefit you in life in general, but the Bible teaches we ought to do this. You have to have that heart like you're serving the Lord. And like I said, it doesn't, don't just be like, oh, yeah, okay, well, that applies to on the job. Yeah, of course, that makes perfect sense. Well, you know what? Kids are on the job at home. You don't, you don't determine, well, I don't like that. I don't want to do that, what mom and dad told me, so I'm just not going to do it, or I'm just going to do a terrible job at it just so I can say I got it done. So when mom or dad asks me, hey, did you get this done? Oh, yeah, I got it done, and it's like the worst job ever. God sees everything that we do, and, and we need, you need to learn how to get that heart and that attitude because the, the, the habits that you form are going to stay with you. Kids, you need to learn how to, if, if someone asks you to do anything, your name is tied to that task, to that job, make your name a good name. Oh, I could trust so-and-so to do this job because when they do it, they, they make sure everything is done. They're diligent in their work. And that's going to be the people that are sought out for the better jobs, the better jobs, the better jobs, the ones that are going to be promoted. I mean, just think about the story with Joseph. I love that story. of I love the life story of Joseph, who went from uh, a, a slave, a prisoner, to number one in charge and served every bit of the way and served faithfully. I mean, he's in prison. You'd be like, I'm not doing any work for you, man. I'm in prison. Like, forget it. I'm just going to, I'm going to lay in my cell and sleep all day or whatever. No, I mean, he was, he was serving even when he was in the jail. He was serving wherever he was. He was doing work. He was, he was keeping himself busy and doing the right thing and, and doing righteous things no matter his situation. And you know what we never see about Joseph one time in the Bible? Now, I'm not saying it didn't ever happen in his life. I mean, there's a lot that isn't recorded in the Bible. But we never see any record of Joseph complaining about his situation in Scripture. Not once. Now, he's 
asking people, hey, bring this up to Pharaoh when you're out here. I mean, I'm here unjustly, right? We see him explaining his cause, but not a complaint. Not a complaint. He's not charging God. He's not going to God. Oh, man, God, why do you got me here? And you know, when you have a servant's heart, you don't complain about the work that you have to do. And again, apply that to wherever you're, wherever you're at. Kids, don't complain about the chores you have to do. Wives, don't complain about the, the commandments of your husband at home. Employees, don't complain about your bosses and what they do. When you complain, it makes everybody's job harder and a discouragement. When we work, we should be working together. And I'm going to get to the family a little bit more in depth later, but just remember this point. Nobody likes working with someone who just always complains. It brings you down. I mean, you need to stay motivated. If you're going to work hard or you get things done, you got to stay motivated. You got to work hard. Encourage each other. Stay motivated. Hey, good job. Now, you might have some other failings. Learn from those things, but don't complain about your work. Even thinking back to, to Pharaoh, when Joseph's family came over, he says, hey, if there's any men of activity among them, put them over my stuff. What does that mean? The people that Joseph was going to say, yeah, they're really diligent. They're really good workers. They're really good servants. They're going to be able to take care of your stuff. Those opportunities will arise when you can just learn how to be humble and do a good job no matter what you're doing. And you, whatever you do, you do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Verse 24 says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance for ye serve the Lord Christ. So God gives you the reason why you ought to serve no matter what you're doing. Serve as if you serve Christ. Because even if your, your worldly master, the person in charge, even if they aren't good to you and they don't pay you what they're supposed to pay you on the job, or your husband doesn't treat you very well and doesn't love you the way he's supposed to according to Ephesians chapter 5 and Colossians 3, if your, your parents don't treat you right as a child, no matter what situation you're in, God sees how you act and will reward you according to your efforts and what you do. And when you do the right thing, you can have a big impact on other people as well just through your actions. People will see that. People will take note of it. But that's not the type of thing that happens immediately. Those are the things that happen over years and years and years and years. That is a slow, a slow um, name that you build. It's what you become known for. But we don't have to worry about even you know, receiving the glory. We ought to be doing it because God tells us to do this. This is what's right. And God will see your struggle and God will reward you. Verse 25, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. It doesn't matter what position you're in. The Bible's saying, look, God doesn't respect persons, so he's going to hold people responsible for their own actions. Which also means if God's telling you to serve as unto the Lord in, like, in all things, basically, then he's going to hold you responsible for not serving when you don't. Keep that in mind, too. And it, this, turn if you would to, uh, to 1 Samuel chapter 15. This was a value that was well established in the past in the United States of America. One of humility, one of politeness, one of being able to treat other people with respect, one where people worked. I grew up in an era that was, hey, you work, you work hard. You know, you do your job, I don't care what it is, shut up, stop complaining, and get to work. But these days, it is so hard to even find anyone who's willing to work. And you know what's going to happen is that these jobs that are available here in this great, uh, 
you know, the, the God-blessed land that we have experienced in general here with the freedom, with the, the, the bounty, with the success, with the, with the luxury. When you get a bunch of people who don't want to work and they're demanding, oh, I'm not going to do anything for this, right? You need to pay me this much. Guess where those jobs are going to go? To people who are willing to do that work. And you're going to be stuck and you're going to end up going into bondage because you're not willing to do anything. It's going to come back and bite the people. And, and it's not a place you want to be, especially as a, you're, you're not going to produce anything and no one's going to want to hire you. Now, when it comes to being a servant and having a servant's heart, and look, this, this context is going to be even in just serving God, but again, can be applied to any capacity. When you are serving, one of the most important things is obedience. Obedience. Look at verse number 22 of 1 Samuel 15. The Bible says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. What he's explaining to Saul, Saul just did these great sacrifices unto the Lord after a victory that they had uh, with their army, right? They, they had battle, they won, so he's, he's offering up these great sacrifices. And you know what Samuel's saying? He's saying, you know what? God's not impressed, and God doesn't care about this great sacrifice that you're offering. You know what he'd rather just have? You obeying. Right. You know what he really wants you to do? Just listen to what he said and do what he said. And that's how you become a faithful servant. Because if God tells you to do something, you do exactly what he tells you to do. You don't take it to mean whatever you want it to mean. You don't just, well, well, I mean, I know God said this, but I mean, here, this is basically the same thing. I'm going to Look, that's a bad servant. That's a bad servant. When you're just going to take what was said, you take the commandment, you take what, the, what was given down, and say, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want with this. Learn how to be humble. Learn how to do the job that's given to you. And like I said, this can apply across the board. Okay, whatever place you find yourself being in obedience, how about you learn to do it the way that you're told from whoever your authority is. This is what God expects. We ought to have that same level of servitude, just in general, whatever capacity that may be. Then he says in verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, the sin of witchcraft, by the way, in the scripture, was worthy of the death penalty. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. The Bible says. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Being stubborn. No, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I told you to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do it this way. No, I want to do it this way. And you start arguing. Can you imagine Someone arguing with God. God tells you to do something, and you're arguing back and forth. Well, I don't want, why do I got to do that, God? I don't want to do that, God. Can you do something? You know, like, the nerve of anyone questioning God and talking back to God and telling God, like, I don't want to do that. We'd be appalled to see if someone were to, to have that type of an attitude with God Almighty. And for good reason. And I think that resonates with everyone. You could perfectly understand that. Of course, no one should ever argue, talk back, be stubborn, be rebellious to God. Well, you know what? If we're supposed to serve as if we're serving Christ, why don't you apply that then to your own servitude? Why don't you apply that then to your boss on the job that tells you to do something and you start arguing and talking back with them? Wives, why don't you apply that when your husband tells you to do something and you start arguing and talking back and being stubborn saying, I don't want to do that. Children, how about you apply that when your parents tell you to do something, you start talking, oh, I don't want to do that. I mean, you know. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Then he says this, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul lost his position of that authority, of that God-given authority, because he was rebellious and stubborn. 
because he didn't listen to God. God took him out of his position of authority. That was the punishment of Saul. Now, let's just jump up a few verses to verse number 18 and see what it was that he even did. You have, wow, he must have done something really bad. I mean, he must have just completely ignored what God said and just did his own thing. Well, yes, he did. But you might be surprised if you don't already know the story of how closely he actually did a lot of the things that God said. But there's just a few tweaks that he made. Well, no, I did this a little bit different. I did that a little bit different. Unacceptable to God because it's not what he told him. Verse number 18, and the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. That was the command given to Saul. Utterly destroy the Amalekites and fight until they be consumed, until they're gone. There is no caveat here. Wipe them out was the command from God Almighty. That was the command. Verse 19, wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Am Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. So he's trying to justify his action, saying, look, I did, I did what God said. I mean, I, I went the way that God told me to go. He says, and he slips in there, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Well, you haven't utterly destroyed the Amalekites because you've got Agag. Yeah. Yeah. Agag is one of the Amalekites. So they're not utterly destroyed. You kind, you kind of missed one there. And willfully, knowingly missed one and did not do what the Lord had said. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things, which should have been utterly destroyed. Like he, and again, he knows, should have been utterly destroyed, because that's what God commanded, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. He said, well, the people took you know, some of the spoil, but it was all for a sacrifice to you anyways. And that's why he said, look, God's not impressed with the sacrifice. God didn't ask for the sacrifice. God didn't command you to give him a sacrifice. He said he wanted it all destroyed and wiped out, and you didn't listen, you didn't obey, so guess what? You're no longer king. Stripped away from you. Your honor, your glory, gone. And I'm going to give it to somebody else. It's obedience. And over and over again in Scripture, we don't see God asking for the great, oh, man, you give all this money, you give this, you give that, you give that. God's not interested in seeing that. What he rather just wants to see is someone humbly serving him. The person who gives $10 million to the building fund at church and gets a name after him and builds a school and everything else, God's not impressed with that. He's way more impressed if that person who does all that stuff is not listening to the Bible, not really caring about what the Word of God says, but they give this great sacrifice. That means nothing to God. He'd much rather have the person who has no money but is still willing to show up to church, go soul winning, read their Bible, do what's right, live a righteous life. That's who God cares more about and has more respect unto than the person who throws around a bunch of money or makes some great sacrifice. Well, I'm going to say all that I have and I'm going to give it unto the Lord. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, but I'm just saying if, if their heart's not right, if they're not a servant, if they're not following and obeying the commandments of God, God cares more about the obedience than he does about the sacrifice. So think about your own obedience. Are you cutting corners or just making up what you want to do, even though you've been told otherwise by whoever your authority is? When it's in the heart, it won't be a problem. When you change the mindset and the attitude and swallow the pride, this doesn't become a problem. It actually becomes easy. You can get yourself to a point to be able to serve. And when you're willing to please and willing to serve, none of that becomes a problem. You're paying more attention. Well, what is it that I'm supposed to do? Uh, obviously, people make mistakes, but where's your heart? Right? Sometimes people, I'm sure I've done things that were not to spec, that weren't right the, the, the way I was told they were supposed to be. But it wasn't, well, I did this because this is better and I didn't want to do what you said. You know, 
If you're doing it just because, oh, it's an oversight. I'm sorry, I missed that. That happens. That's different than, yeah, I didn't want to do that. That takes me way too much time. I, I, I don't have time for that. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. A good servant, someone with a servant's heart, they're going to show up on time, whatever the task. They're going to be faithful, which means you're reliable, you're dependable. If someone's got a job for you, you get it done. Trustworthy, does, don't have to worry about the servant at all. Doesn't complain. Doesn't make your job harder because now you got to deal with someone complaining. Add the extra stress. And, you know, normally people who are in the positions of authority and power, you're adding so much more stress on that person that already probably has a load of responsibility on their shoulders when you start complaining about things. I mean, when kids start complaining to mom, ah, oh, man, it isn't. Look, mom's already busy doing this, this, that, you know, 20 other things. She doesn't need to deal with you now complaining. There's already a big enough load on her shoulders. And again, I mean, apply it across the board. Just one example. Good servant is willing to work extra. Go above and beyond just what you're asked to do. And does as instructed. Romans 12, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. It means not lazy. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Same mindset. It's consistent. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, Look, these are qualities of someone who's ready to serve. Distributing to them to say, oh, this other brother in Christ, sister in Christ, they have a need, the necessity of the saints, someone who's sanctified in Christ. Oh, you have a need, I'm going to distribute to them. Not, well, you know, I was saving this for my vacation and my boat and my whatever. Oh, someone's in need. Oh, look, I could help that person out. Here you go. Give in to hospitality. Yes, it can be uh, uh, extra work to be hospitable to people. Of course it is. You have to go out of your way to help, with, with it, wh whether you're feeding someone, having them stay, you know, that, that's extra work. But if you're going to do that, do it with the right heart. Do you think someone's going to want to stay at your house if you're complaining, oh, man, now i got to do this, and it, you know, now i got extra laundry. Now. It's like, look, <laughs> don't be that way. Now, now you're going to be, you know, it, be hospitable, distribute to necessity without the murmuring and complaining. Everybody knows it's extra work. You should. Do it joyfully because you know what? You're serving God. You're serving the Lord when you're serving others. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Ver look at verse 15. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Have the appropriate attitude when you serve. When there's a cause for rejoicing, hey, why don't you just rejoice with people? Be an encouragement to them. Something's going good. Don't be the Debbie Downer that's just going to point out, ah, oh, well, you know, you, someone's got a victory and then you're just like bringing up the the. Well, you know, it would have been better if you had, you know, it's like, look, just, how about you celebrate the victory? How about you be an encouragement, right? When you're working for someone, when you're ministering to them, you're supposed to be helping them in every way possible, not trying to just drag them down every step along the way. If there's a reason to rejoice, rejoice. If there's a reason to weep, weep with them, right? Be there for them. In all things, just be there for them and help appropriately and not go like Job's friends, right? Job loses everything. He needs someone there to just to comfort him and to help him through a difficult time. Going, oh, man, yeah, well, Job. Well, I mean, you, you must have been in some kind of, so why don't you tell us what horrible things you did, Job? You must have done something. And start bringing railing accusations against Job and against his children. He lost all his children. He lost everything. He's got, you know, he's, he's got a disease. Like, like 
Leave the guy alone. How about you comfort him a little bit? Like he said, they're miserable comforters. Verse 16, be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for as written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, obviously, he's talking about enemies and things like that and say, hey, God's going to revenge. God's going to repay. You just do what's right. But we can apply this to if you are a servant and the person who is in charge is treating you bad, is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, maybe not holding up their end of the deal, but you are still doing what's righteous. You still do what's right. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Continue to do what's right. We saw that with Jacob. You know, Jacob said you know, his, his wages were changed 10 times. He had all these problems. You know, he was bearing the cost of stuff that wasn't really he shouldn't have been bearing the cost of. When you read through that story and you compare that with what the word of God says, you know, when things are stolen by night, like if you're working for someone else, that you're not really responsible for that because sometimes things happen and it's not your responsibility. But in other situations, it is your responsibility because that's your job, right? But there's certain times where there's nothing you can do about it and the owner of that stuff, that's gonna end up being their loss. Well, Jacob bear the brunt of all of, this, all of the loss, all of these other things. And that was taken out of his paycheck, right? But he still did the best job that he could. And God still blessed Jacob. And Laban, in turn, ended up getting blessed because God blessed Jacob. Because Jacob continued to do what was right. And he didn't quit and say, oh, well, you're not treating, you know, whatever. He, he did his work. He did what he was supposed to do. And don't take this the wrong way. Obviously, you could, like, switch jobs if something's not going right at your job. But he had committed to him for years. I mean, he was, he was working off wives and and working off all this stuff, like, like he made a long contract to fulfill for his role and his job there. I mean, that was his situation. These days, we don't really generally do those types of contracts for working and stuff. You're free to go anywhere you want, but wherever you're at, don't complain about it. And while you're there, do the best job that you have. And even if you plan on leaving to go somewhere else, don't just take off in your mind and just like, oh, now I'm not going to do anything because I'm already going to this place. You work the best that you can until the day that you leave. Yeah. Right. Because it's right. Yeah. Because we're supposed to be serving as if we're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. How about being an encouragement to those you support instead of a hindrance, right? If you're a servant, you're there to help. Focus on being an encouragement. Encourage, how about in church? Encourage the man of God. Be encouraged. You know that you just showing up to church, we got this, this challenge coming up in September of, of church attendance, right? Showing up to all three services. You don't even realize what an encouragement you are to me. You're encouragement. You being here and filling that seat encourages me. Seeing the people, you know, people make sacrifices of their time to be part of this church, which I have been given the, the opportunity of being the overseer of, it's an encouragement. It's encouragement seeing you grow, seeing you volunteer, seeing you do things in the church. That encourages me a lot. And you know what? It doesn't just encourage me. It encourages other people too. When people can work together and be an encouragement and not a complainer, and not, oh, this person does this, and this person does that, and this, you know, like, look, if we could just, just learn to be humble, swallow your pride, when you get a group of people together, there's going to be people who upset you and do wrong and, and cause problems. 
Obviously, I'm speaking really generically. There's other, there's situations that may arise that are going to need to be dealt with, you know, if there's conflict. But the Bible prescribes how to deal with that. But you know what's never right is complaining and murmuring. This is going to bring everything down. If there's, a, if there's a complaint, you can go about it and deal with it appropriately and deal with it hopefully face-to-face -face with that person. If, not, if that's not going to work, there's other avenues of dealing with things. And that's fine. And we'll deal with things the right way. And I'm not saying you just have to brush everything under the rug if there's a, a, a problem somewhere. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we could maintain a proper servant's attitude and role. Now, an easy illustration can be you signed up to serve cleaning the building, right? You sign up to serve. You sign up to be a servant. Well, then the servant should be doing the best job that you can do, first of all, right? You, you do your job well. And look, everybody here does their job well. So I'm not, don't think like, oh, Pastor Bird, now we're getting to the point where he's targeting, you know. No, these are all just examples. I appreciate everybody's service. But, but here's, a, here's what could happen, though, right? Maybe there's a mess. It could be well in my area, right? It probably is right now. <laughs> now, I should be responsible. We should be responsible. My family should be responsible for picking up after ourselves. But maybe we don't. Maybe we just leave. Maybe things get busy, or we just go, or maybe we just have a really bad attitude and said, you know what? Someone else will just deal with this. I'm leaving. I don't even care. Okay? Now, look, that's not right. We should be willing to, to do, you know, keep up after ourselves and do what's right. But the servant who's already signed up to do that job, look, people do that. Don't complain about that. Do the best job. You know, from time to time, I'm going to try to get on everyone and be like, hey, look, help these guys out. But, but don't be, you know, don't let that make you upset and, and, and feel like you're slighted. Just suck it up and serve. Just serve, right? Be an encouragement. I don't even know how I got off. This wasn't even in my notes. I mean, obviously, it has to do with everything I'm preaching on, but I was going to turn to, uh, turn if you would, to, to Hebrews chapter 13, because I was starting to go into, like, the, well, I guess it got, ah, I get it now, in the, in the church service. But this was more, I was thinking more to do with, the, like, encouraging, you know, leadership and the people in charge. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 137, also the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. This is Moses speaking, saying, Thou also shalt not go in thither, but Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither, encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. This is God speaking to Moses, telling Moses to encourage Joshua. Hey, you, Moses was the leader. I mean, he was above everybody, humanly speaking, in that order of, of who's in charge and order of authority. But He's saying, well, you need to encourage Joshua. You know, and the person doing the encouragement also is like ministering to him, right? So he's like, you, you need to be helping Joshua out here, encourage him, because he's going to be taking the, the people in, and he needs that support, and he needs that encouragement, and he needs that from you, right? You need to be able to help Joshua to, to move forward. And you see people doing a work. Joshua is set to do a good work. It's not just Moses. Anyone can be there to help and be the encouragement and say, hey, well, hey what, you're doing this all the time. What can I do to help you out? You show up to someone's soul winning time, but they run on time. Hey, is there anything that I could do to help you out? Now, we don't have a lot going on right now. Right? We're still a small church. But as we continue to grow, there's more logistics. There's more things to deal with. Find a way to be a good servant and one that's not going to just add extra to the plate but rather be a good encouragement the bible says in hebrews 13 did i have you turn to hebrews 13 look at verse number seven the bible says remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of god whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation now in church there are people who have the rule over you and that's me in this church obviously christ is the head and is at the top no matter what 
So everything that's in the Bible and what Christ would say is, is the, the law of the land here. That's like what we, what we turn to, what we follow. But as far as being a bishop or an overseer guide, I'm in that position. When we have elder or deacons or you know, any other positions, or if there's multiple elders here, again, it would, it, this, the same thing we consider. These are people that would consider to have the rule over you. I have the rule over how things are run in this church. And again, this isn't a problem, so don't, I don't want people running around thinking, like, oh, but, but, but if something's going to be done here, I'm going to say this is the way things are done. And maybe that bothers you. And maybe you don't like that. Okay? And, and maybe you don't like that I have black chairs and gray chairs. And then a different shade of gray chairs. I don't know, whatever. I'm just thinking about, I'm just looking at the room right now going, like, what could someone, I mean, what could you not like about this place? But you don't like that I put the nice, soft ones right up front. Like, I don't want to sit up by you that close. I want to sit back there. Whatever, right? Silly example, I know. But, but look, th there is an order here. Don't go around complaining and murmuring and talking in people's ears. That's not going to help us get the job done. We're all here to serve in some capacity, right? We're all ministers of the word of God. We're all here to serve one another. We're all here to serve the Lord ultimately. We're all here to serve the lost by preaching in the gospel. We have main objectives to get done here. Let's not worry about the little things, the minutia, the details, and just cause a bunch of problems. Let's, let's be able to get past that stuff and say, I understand. I'm going to respect that authority. And, I, and maybe I don't always agree with everything, but Pastor Burson is the leader here, so we're going to do things the way that he says. And I'll tell you this much, too. When there's a leader, I don't care where you're at, if you know how to approach someone, if you have a different idea that you think might be better, that's great. There's nothing wrong with making a suggestion to a boss. The problem comes in when the boss says, nope, this is the way we're going to do it, and then you still choose to do otherwise. That's where there's a problem. Right? There's been plenty of times in my employment where I said, hey, I, you know, you told me to do this, and I'll do this. But I think we would be better served as a company if we do this instead. And sometimes my ideas have been accepted, and sometimes they've been rejected. But you know what I do every time? Whatever the boss says. Because that's your job. Because that's your role. And like I said, these things will apply across the board. These are all characteristics of a servant and having a servant's heart. Jump down to verse number 17, the Bible says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. So when you are serving someone else, someone else is in charge, so what's the ruler? Excuse me. There's a reason for it. Here he gives the reason of those that have the rule over you in the house of God because they're looking out for your souls. Okay? So don't make their job harder. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Don't make that job grievous. Try to make it joyful. Make it something that's going to be uh, not where they're going, oh, man, i got to deal with this person again. But going, oh, great, I'm happy to help so-and-so. Now, again, you know, we're, we're all human, but, like, the leader said, well, the leader shouldn't ever have that attitude. Yeah, I, I know. You shouldn't. They should be able to be joyful in all the work that they do. But you can make things harder for them, regardless of what their mindset is about it. They could be joyful about it and still making their job harder. Let's have the consideration and the respect for those that you are serving, right? Because if you're serving, you're trying to help them. Whoever you're serving, you're trying to make their job easier. The wife that serves her husband, what can you do to make your husband's job easier? The children that serve the parents, what can you do to make your parents' job easier? The church member, what can you do to make your leader's job easier? On the, on the job, what can you do to make your boss's life easier? I've got a great employee that works for me, and i got two actually that work for me outside of here. And when I hear them say, yeah, I'm always trying to, you know, I could see it, and they say, oh, I'm trying to do things so that you have a lot on your plate. I want to try to take some of those things out. That is one of the best things that I could ever hear. Because I've got a lot on my plate all the time when people could say, hey, I want to do that for you so you don't have to do it. <sighs> Thank you. That's great. 
And when you can have that heart towards other people, oftentimes what you'll find is then that gets reciprocated back to you too. No great leader becomes a great leader by be being given a title of authority and then going, oh, now I could be the leader. And now, you know, you're never a great leader that way. When you rule based on title and not based on how you lead and not having that, that right heart to lead. What I mean by that is, you know, like, like Moses was humble. He was one of the most meek men upon the earth, right? And God gave him that position. We just saw about King Saul. When Samuel's rebu rebuking him in that story, we I don't think we read this in the context, but in, in that same passage, he's saying, you know, when you were little in your own eyes, that's when God exalted you and lifted you up. Because back when he was humble, he was willing to do whatever the Lord said. And he started to do that. He was just going, okay, well, God said this. He was little, little, but then he got lifted up with pride. He lost that humility and started to do things his own way. And that's when he got into trouble. We've got to keep that humble attitude. Uh, let's see. I don't, want, I don't even want to cover that. It's already later than I thought it was going to be. I think we'd probably all agree that Elisha was, was someone who was considered to be a great leader. A man of God, right? A great man of God, did all kinds of miracles, served the Lord excellently. But you know that he started off being a servant, being a minister? You know what? So did Joshua. Joshua was Moses' protege. Joshua was there to serve Moses. Joshua was there the whole way. Hey, Joshua had, you know, he could have been like, well, I was one of the the two that came the good report and I deserve more and you should give me, you know, he didn't have that attitude at all. I knew we should have followed the Lord, but you know what? He didn't complain when they went, when they're wandering through the wilderness. He just kept serving, so kept serving God, kept serving Moses. And then eventually when Moses wasn't allowed to go in, Joshua, now it's your turn to lead the way. But he had spent years and years and years and years just being a humble servant, being that right hand man being the guy that could be faithful, reliable, dependable, and just serve, 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 and then God exalts. And that's the way things work. And that's the same thing with Elisha and Elijah. The Bible says in, in 2 Kings 3.11, turn if you would to 1 Peter chapter 3, which I don't even know if we have to really cover that, but um, I think we've kind of done a good job with, with everything here. 2 Kings 3.11, the Bible says, But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So Jehoshaphat, he's, he, they're going into battle. He's going like, look, I need to inquire of the Lord before I go and, and get into this fight. And they're like bringing up all these phonies and all these false prophets. Yeah, the Lord's with you. Go for it, man. God's with you. Know, and he's like, can we find someone here that's, you know, actually a prophet of the Lord? You know, <laughs> someone that uh, I, I actually have some respect for and... and, and Follows God's word. And it says, And one of the king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. You know what that's showing us there? He was a servant. And we know that too, because before Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, Elisha's like, Hey, I'm with you to the end. I'm not leaving. And, and, and Elijah's even saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to be caught up. I don't know what's going to happen. I might be here. I might be there. You know, he's like, I don't care. And he's like, Why don't you just stay here? Why don't you stay back here? No, nope, I'm with you staying with you. He was faithful. He was dedicated. He was, he was washing his hands. I mean, that's a pretty humble job, pouring the water. Hey, my hands are dirty. Can you wash my hands for me? Can you pour the water? Yeah, sure. I'll do it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then we see the great works Elisha did. The great leaders know how to serve. You start off with that humble beginning. I mean, that, that's that's what gains you the respect of other people anyways. You know how to serve. Don't think that that's just something for the leader. That's for you. Even if you're never going to be, in your own eyes, some leader, you already are a leader. You already are a leader. Adults, you're leaders, whether you know it or not. You say, well, I'm a single guy. I don't even have a family. There are other people that look to you in other settings where you are an example. 
you don't know also what God has in store for you, and you are a servant in some capacity. Like I said, everybody is, because everybody's a servant to Christ, no matter who you are. And second of all, you have other authorities in your life, just in general, in many capacities. Learn how to serve and serve righteously and serve from the heart and be that servant. It will, it will bless your life, your entire existence here on this and life to come. Because when you learn how to serve the Lord in that humility and, serve, and, and just become that servant, man, God is going to bless you. Promise. Because God said that he is going to see the work that you do, and he will bless you for it. Colossians 3, we already read that. It's a promise. There is no downside to this. And in fact, when you become that type of servant, it's, it makes everything better. More work gets done. People are going to be, and, and look, I'm going to finally just kind of apply this directly to the home. Because... Homes need to be unified. They need to be unified. And there's been so much attack on, the, on men's and women's roles and compared to what God has in store and what God has written. It causes div division. It causes problems in the home. And if everybody in the home can really get the true heart of a servant, I'm talking everyone in the home, you wouldn't have problems in the home so much strife and i mean just goes away when you're considering others better than yourself and you're working for them now look you also have to follow the authority structure so when the husband says this is gonna this is the way we're gonna do things and he's in charge it doesn't matter if he's right or wrong when the boss at work tells you to do something, it doesn't matter if he's right or wrong. You do what the boss says. You don't obey because, well, I'm only going to obey because I think he's right. No, you obey because you're in submission. That's why you obey. And the only time you disobey is if there's a higher authority that prevents you from doing that, whatever that is. So anyone that tells you to do something that would prevent you from serving God, like to, from obeying God's commands, then obviously you don't have to do that. But that is it. That's the limitation. That's the exception. In Ephesians 5, we see, hey, your wives, serve your husbands as unto the Lord. That's how you're supposed to do it in everything. 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says in verse number 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. So, you know, even if your husband isn't right and isn't doing right, or maybe isn't even saved, you still live a godly wife, as a godly wife, because you don't know by you doing that can win other people over. They could see your good works and it will pay off. But you do what's right because it's right. You know, husbands, wives, children, you're on the same team, you're in a family. You don't need to be fighting against each other. Don't fight against the authority. Don't fight against, uh, you know, your own, the, the members of your own household. How about instead of complaining or fighting, oh, man, this and this, how about you encourage each other? It's going to make the existence at home that much better. Wives, support your husbands. Husbands and wives both have hard jobs to do. It both, you, respective in your own areas, Husbands and wives both have lots of hard work to do, equally hard work. But you know what? When husbands and wives get together and just talk about, and you just talk about all the negative, all the bad things, that doesn't encourage your spouse at all. It actually makes their job even harder because if they love you, they're going to try, oh, man, how can I help and fix this now for this person? Don't worry about that stuff. Don't complain about your job and your work. How about you focus on the good things? And what else can I do for you? I had a really hard day, but what, how can I help you out? And see what that does to the atmosphere at home. Just test it. Try it out. The Bible talks about the... the 
contentious life. Contentious means you're always contending, always arguing. For the wife that always wants to argue with her husband, here's what the Bible says in Proverbs 25, 24. The Bible says it is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. As cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. Uh, Proverbs 27, 15 says a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. That annoyance of the continual dropping, like drop, drop, drop like will it ever stop? Or here, here's what the continual dropping is. When your smoke detector, when the battery needs to be replaced, <laughs> beep, <laughs> beep. <laughs> Shut up, <laughs> you're gonna rip this thing off the wall, right? It's terrible. No one likes hearing that type of stuff. That's the continual dropping, but you know what? The contentious woman, the Bible says they're like, it's the same level of frustration. You know what? That's only gonna cause more problems. A servant's heart. Learn how to serve. And I understand. We're all human. We, we all make mistakes. We all have problems. We all have the sin. We all have the, this flesh. But if we can get down this concept and this idea of being a servant, and the more you, you know, leaders do well by serving also, because you could also understand where the other person's coming from. And you need to try to do that as well in your leadership. Well, hey, I've served other people. I know what this is like. I'm going to utilize that knowledge and that wisdom in the way that I lead as well. Right? And being a leader doesn't mean you have to be a jerk and just treat people bad. I mean, you should never do that as a leader. But as the servant, even if someone does mistreat you, you still have the role of a servant. You still have that job to perform. It doesn't absolve you of what your job is. We should be striving to, in all things, do it, whatever we do, we do it heartily as unto the Lord. And would to God we could raise up a society of people who had a servant's heart. What a joy. If everywhere you went, everything that you did, you know, when you have a servant heart, you know you're going to get good customer service. Service, right? Customer. Good night. No one wants to serve. I'm going to close on this. It just popped in my head. I had to get a receipt for a purchase I made yesterday because I was on the job. I was working. I went to a food place, and I needed to get, I needed to get my receipt because it was, it was paid for by the company. And I said, oh, yeah, can I get my receipt, please? Because a lot of places, they won't even give it to you unless you ask because they're saving paper or whatever. I don't care. Use a card. Uh, I'm out of paper. Okay. I need the receipt, though, because this is a business transaction for me. I need, I need the receipt. Well, I'm, I'm out of paper. Well, how long have you been out of paper for? I'm sitting there at the drive, you know, because I don't care. I'm at the, I mean, I need this receipt. How long have you been out of paper for? Uh, uh, well, um... Uh, like a few days, I think, you know, like, okay, can you email it to me? You know, I'm trying to be reasonable here. Can you email me? No. Um, okay, so I was just going to go forward. He's like, excuse me, sir, you know, tell them up front. They should be able to print it out for you. Why didn't you say that already, like, the first time I asked you? I said, well, I'm out of paper. And, and then she said, can you also tell them that I'm out of paper? I thought you've been out of paper for days. Like, what, what do you mean? Like, oh, I'm going to do your job for you. You know, I did anyway. It's kind of like, Oh, yeah, here you go. Here's your, you know, you're not out of paper. You're just literally out of paper, and you don't want to go walk and get the other paper for your print, for your receipt roll. And, you know, I'm not saying this to complain, because I don't care. Like, it, the whole thing was just kind of funny to me, kind of stupid. But this is just, like, the world that we, it's just, it exemplifies where we are today as a society. Yeah. Right. That never would have flown, like, a few decades ago, ever. Like, no way, no one I ever worked for, I mean, we had standards. Like, you don't, you don't do that. Seriously, I know it's funny. Standards, can you imagine that? We had standards. These days, it's like, if you could just show up and punch in, that's the standard for employment today, and it's sad. Yeah. And the reason why is because people don't have a servant's heart. 
They're lifted up, they're conceited, they're full of themselves. We live in this social media culture where everything's about me. Look at me, look how great I am. Give me all the likes, give me all the thumbs up, give me all the hearts. How about you serve? It's not about you, it's about others. As far as I have a word of prayer, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity and the job of being ministers of yours and, and uh, you, you've given to us the responsibility of the ministry of reconciliation that's the most important job of reconciling people unto you through Christ Lord and, and uh, preaching the gospel to people I pray that you would please help us to become better servants help us to serve you better help us to look to your words and look to the law and look to follow uh, your every command and do so in a way that is completely in compliance with how you want things done, Lord, and that we're not just um, taking extra liberties in how we serve you uh, that would conflict with what you've told us to do. I pray that you please help us to, to have that good understanding and knowledge of how you'd have us to serve you, dear Lord, and then help us also to apply that same attitude in, in the rest of the service in our lives, no matter who we're serving, whatever role we're in. Um, I pray that you please help us to become better at that job and um, Lord, we love you. We ask for your blessing upon our church. And Lord, also please keep us safe when we go our separate ways this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.